Well, our text this evening will be found in the fifth chapter of Galatians, from verse uh, 25, and then the first verse of chapter 6. And we read this, in fact we could start at 24, And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And our subject tonight from the Holy Word of God is this, conflict and injured comrades. How to behave in conflict in the church and what to do for the poor brother or sister where it's gone badly wrong in the conflict and they've fallen into sin. The briefest of said and in context, you've heard it many times before, but for any dear ones gathered here that are not familiar with the background of Galatians, the Apostle Paul is writing to this church, false teachers have crept in and said to them, it's not as simple as trusting in Jesus for your salvation. You can't just trust in Christ for his wonderful gift on the cross of forgiveness to all sinners that truly repent and put their faith in him. No, 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 there was the old ceremonial law. You need to be observing some of this. And the Apostle Paul in many different ways has gone back and refuted it, argued against it so strongly. It's the only one of his epistles where he gives no commendation whatsoever to these poor Galatians. He's not harsh with them, but he doesn't give them any commendation. And having proved uh, the falseness of that position, and I pray each and every one of us here tonight knows the wonderful freedom in Christ, that our awful condemnation, if you've looked at him, a glance of faith, as we heard this morning from Brother Ed, just a touch on the hem of Christ, metaphorically, by faith, however feeble, and he lovingly and willingly has forgiven all of your sin, never to be seen again in terms of judgment before God. We'll know the bitter effects of it until the day we die, but never to be seen again in terms of judgment. I hope you know that glorious freedom this evening. And if you don't, can I urge you, as our brother did this morning, as soon as this service is finished, before that, in your heart, make peace for your maker. He has done everything to you, everything that you may be right with him and spared judgment. Well, the Apostle Paul has spent many chapters refuting that in many ways, and we won't go over the arguments again, but it's a wonderful uh, learning curve. And he's assured him in the fifth chapter that you are free. You have tremendous liberty. You're free from the ceremonial law. We're not free from the moral law. We're free from its condemnation, but we can't go around and start stealing and coveting and breaking the Lord's day willy-nilly, saying it doesn't matter. We want to please our Father in heaven, but we are free from its condemnation. But he's now addressing things because he's warning them in the last half of this chapter that this wonderful freedom which a believer has, don't abuse it. You can imagine the tensions there. You've got the false teachers proclaiming the ceremonial law still and you need to observe all the festivals and be circumcised and a million other things. You've got the uh, ones who are truly born again saying, no, we don't need to do this. Christ has done everything. And then you've got some weaker believers that, whilst they know Christ has done everything, they're thinking, well, I might just do it anyway. And there's tension. And that's why he, he goes through the works of the flesh, what to avoid, and then the fruit of the Spirit. When we're like this, we're walking in the Holy Spirit. And he, he, he comes on here in verse uh, 26, really. It's what we consider first, conflict. What to avoid in the conflict. And how... Apt that is for church life, isn't it? I remember when I was first converted, I thought, this is wonderful, I'm part of a church, this is in February 1998. It won't be like the world. We'll never argue, because we all love the Lord and we love each other. Well, that's true, isn't it? But if you've been a Christian long enough, you'll know, sadly, it should be like that. It will be like that one day, but sadly, it can often not be like that. And we're told in this first verse, and in the 26th verse, under our first heading now, conflict, there are three things to avoid. And I know we went over this before, but it's such an important um, subject 
This is really where the rubber hits the road. They say with a real soldier, you'll know what you're really like when you're in battle. You can be trained to the nth degree, but you'll know how well you're trained when you're in battle. And brothers and sisters, we'll know what we're really like as Christians when we are in the conflict, whether it's in church, at work, or at home. What are these three things then? Well, the first word is this, conceited. Conceited. Translated in the authorised version as vainglory. Now, it comes from a Greek word, kenodoskos. Kenos, which means empty, and doxa, which means glory. And what it means is something like this, to be conceited or to boast about, well, there's nothing to boast about. It's vainglory. It's empty conceit. You're boasting about something you shouldn't be boasting about. It's the only time it's ever used is in Galatians 5, 26. Now, what was going on? Well, think about it. You've got the Jewish, Jewish people, and they're glorying in their lineage, their, their descent. Do you remember they were so proud that they were descended from Abraham? Oh, we're from Abraham. Do you remember Christ said, my father could raise up people from Abraham from these stones. So they're glorying in their position. And perhaps some of the weaker believers are attaching too much to that. But then on the other side of the coin, you've got the true born again Christians going, we don't glory in Abraham. We glory in, now what do you think they're going to say? Christ? No, our freedom in Christ. It's the freedom. And both are so sure that they're right. So they're glorying in their point of view. What does the Lord say we should glory in if we're a believer here today? Well, he tells us in Jeremiah 9, verse 23 and 24. Listen to these magnificent words. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. How often we do that? We all have to confess this, don't we? that we glory in our position. It may be a right position. It may be absolutely doctrinally correct, but we glory in holding the position instead of that wonder and glory that Christ has forgiven our sins, that we have a relationship with the living God. And that affects everything. How easy it is to stand for the truth in the wrong way, here in the pulpit, but also in the pew. Let us avoid vain glory conceit, boasting about things that should never be boasting about. If we're going to boast, and it doesn't mean in a fleshly way, if we're going to be thrilled about something, let us be thrilled that we know the living God through Christ. The second thing we're warned about is provoking one another. This comes from a Greek word, prokaliame, and it means to call forth, to challenge. It reminds me of the cockerel. We've named Gerald in our garden. He puffs his chest out and he crows. Well, if you're in a position within the church and you're so sure, but in a very fleshly way, not just in a gentle way, it's not just you're sure what scripture teaches, but it's this fleshly assurance that will naturally lead on to, well, I'm going to prove my point. And you will call forth and I will call forth. It may be done very subtly, but we've got that spirit inside us. Oh, I'm going to show them that church meeting. Wait till I see such and such and we're going to have this out. We're going to challenge and this is what we're being warned against because this is the, uh, the, the works of the flesh from verses 19 and, and 20 and 21. This is the jealousies, the outbursts of wrath, the selfish ambitions, the contentions. This is what causes strife. Whereas the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, self-evidently cause peace and harmony. And how easy it is, brothers and sisters, we look back at our checkered Christian life. How easy it is, you have to confess to yourself, as I do myself, to fall into that spirit, to prove a point. It's one thing to lovingly, as we'll consider how we can do this, how the Lord instructs us in the first verse of the next chapter, to lovingly come alongside someone uh, with the word of God, to show them where they're uh, misaligned, if you like. But it's a completely another thing. I can't wait to get in there and crush these people with the word of God. We must avoid this at all costs. We're told to be long-suffering, to control ourselves, to have that gentle, meek spirit of our Saviour. 
And then the third thing we're told to avoid is envying. And this means from the Greek word pathonio to become bitter, to become sour because of another person's success. Well, you can imagine, can't you, there at Galatia, you've got your camp set out, they're in a wrong spirit, they're sure they're right, and some of them were right, but they're glorying in their position, they're calling for things sideways, so we see them, I'm going to definitely prove them wrong this Lord's Day. And then things aren't going their way, and there's a bitterness, and there's a jealousy. And that's an awful thing for a believer to get into that state, and for a pastor to get into that state. A sour, bitter thing. Things aren't going their way. Oh, they've got more influence than me. People are listening to them. People are looking at them. It's a wicked sin to fall into. Yes, we should be jealous for the truth of God. Yes, we should be jealous in uh, protecting Christians from harm and to see off the wolves that will try and come in the flock, to see off those that would prey upon people. Those, as Paul was doing, he gets very worked up earlier on, didn't he? He wishes these false teachers were cut off. Because it was a, a gospel truth. It could send people to hell. We're right to stand for that. But these other things, this spirit of bitterness that comes in. No, that is a completely wrong thing. I remembered, as I was studying this, a very marked example of this in the world. Bitterness and envy. You might remember this. Do you remember a few years ago, I think it was in Nairobi in Kenya, and some terrorists stormed a hotel? And there was a SAS guy that was out there on, on an exercise on training. He was the only one with some other people he was attached. And he heard about what was going on in the hotel. He grabbed his weapon. There's a picture of him. You can find him. There's a video even, I think. They've obscured his face. He's just in jeans. He grabs um, a body armor. He runs in there with a couple of policemen. And he rescues lives. He takes out some terrorists. And he's quite rightly lauded. Even the president, then president of America met him and, and recognized him. He was so impressed. Do you know what happened when he got back to Hereford, where the SES are based? Did he get a hero's welcome? No, he didn't. He had to leave. Because this is what they said. Instead of saying, well done, mate. You did a good job there. We've done that. We've done stuff like that. And yet, we're not in the papers. We've not met President Trump. And the envy was so bitter that he'd, in the end he thought, oh, I can't put up with this, and he left. And yet, brothers and sisters, we can be like this. One minister said to me, gave me advice, and I don't suffer for this at the moment, but I heed the advice. He said, be very aware of ministerial envy. If someone comes along and, and they're a visiting preacher, or uh, say Ed was preaching and the Lord really blesses the message, beware the spirit of envy. I said, really? Is it possible to be like that? He said, yes. It's one of the things you can battle against. But can we not be like that in church? Someone else is doing another ministry. Someone else has some influence. Whatever it is, friendships. And yet people can get envious and jealous. So we must watch that. Well, we move on to our second heading, which is injured comrades. We're told that we're soldiers, aren't we? We're called many things, sheep, soldiers, Children of God, soldiers. And I've called it injured comrades in verse 6 because how are we to act when without any shadow of doubt, for want of a better word, someone is in, in the wrong? They've been overtaken in a trespass. How are we to act? And this verse 6 is so instructive. It's so all about what Jesus Christ is about. And it will um, really help us and it's particularly, obviously, for those that are overseers, but for all Christians, if you meet certain qualifications. So, how do we deal with this? And once again, we're not talking about a false teacher. We're not talking about someone that's, um, uh, who when we went through in 2 Peter 2, that comes in and morally creates havoc in the church. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a brother or a sister that's fallen into sin. Well, the first thing, our first point under this is brethren. Brethren, listen to this, 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Brothers and sisters, when someone falls in the battle, the first thing you must remember is they are brethren. They are a child of God. Christ has hung on the cross. He's looked through time and cast a loving eye upon them. He's paid the price for all their sin. Yes, they've stumbled, they've fallen. They're in obvious error, they're in obvious uh, practice of sin. 
And yet Christ loves them. You're not going to see your mortal enemy. You're going to see someone who the Lord loves too. And if we can remember that and see through the particular issue, I'm going to see someone else who Jesus loves. That is a great help. Oh, how that would make a difference to our attitude. I'm going to see another child of God. Secondly, they've been overtaken. We're not talking about the habitual sinner, though they need dealing with love, but in a, in a different way. But you're talking about someone that's living their everyday Christian life, if, if there is such a thing, and they've been overtaken. In the reference Bible I use, they reference David, where he was overtaken by sin. One spring evening, I think it was, and he cast his eyes upon Bathsheba and he fell into sin. Overtaken. And it's in any trespass. It might be a small thing. Now, some things it's wise to let go. If you, we'd, be, we'd be speaking to each other all the time, wouldn't we? If you picked up every tiny little thing. But any trespass. It's not that if it was some really... Big sin, we, we say, well, we don't deal with it like that. This is so serious. We go steaming in there. Uh, we, we may well have to take radical action. But these attitudes must still apply. They're a child of God that stumbled and fallen. Now, it says here, you who are spiritual, restore. That is twofold, a twofold meaning here. One is you must be in a spiritual state of mind yourself. You must know something of these to a reasonable measure of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. If you're feeling all uptight and, and bitter and twisted, then you're going to be no good to them. you do more damage than good. And yet, sadly, we try and um, help someone out, perhaps, in a wrong way to make ourselves feel better. But also I feel the Apostle Paul, the, the Lord is saying through this, uh, you who are spiritual, if you think yourself spiritual, and there you are, you're going to sort this problem out, well, you'll do it in a spirit of gentleness then. Imagine uh, if you didn't uh, deal with it in that way, if you're not in a spiritual, if you're backslidden yourself and you think, actually, you're feeling a bit twisted up, oh, I'm going to put this person right. The hypocrisy. Imagine if you've got a man that's just been shoplifting in Sainsbury's and he's running out the door with his carrier bags and he sees a, a man trying to steal a car. He said, what are you doing? That's a shocking thing. But yet we can do this. See, much of our sin is unseen to anyone but our Heavenly Father, but he sees it. Now, I'm not talking about living the perfect Christian life, otherwise no one would come alongside anyone, but there are certain levels. So we must be have a spiritual attitude, and we must know something of these fruits in our life. We're not to do it from a position of conceit, of vainglory, to show them that we're right. This is just what we've been waiting for. We're going to provoke them. We're going to uh, proclaim it. We're going to call them out in the wrong spirit. We're going to rub their nose in it. We're going to take envy and delight that this one who's just irritated us so much that they've fallen into sin. That is a wicked position to be in. We're to avoid that. So if we're in the right spiritual frame of mind and we know something of that gentleness of Christ, then how are we to deal with them? Well, there's a critical word. It says, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a, spiritual of gen a spirit of gentleness. Restoration. Well, there's our first lesson. It's not an act of punishment. It's not an act of, right, wait, I can't wait to get the disciplinary process on this one. This is an act of restoration. We're looking to restore this person into a right relationship with Christ. Now, this word restore is a fascinating word. It's cartesio, and it means this, to fit or join together, uh, to bring into its proper condition, whether for the very first time or after a lapse. And it was often used for the setting of a broken bone or a dislocated limb. And isn't that what it's like? When you've fallen into sin, you feel spiritually dis dislocated. You'll be in pain. You'll be cold-hearted. You'll have a lack of true peace and joy. You'll know something of a spirit of bitterness. And you'll be displaying more of the fruits of the works of the flesh than the fruits of the spirit. 
It's such an instructive word, this restore. They're in pain. Imagine if you saw uh, a, a man and he was limping down the street because he'd broken his leg. And he went up to him and said, what are you walking like that for, you idiot? And pushed him in the leg. You should walk like this. He'd say, it's brutal. It reminds me of some of the instructors I had in the army. But yet, spiritually, we can be like this. Why are you acting like that? It's so wrong. A swift uh, quoting of a verse. But that's awful, isn't it? That's not that spirit of gentleness. So we're going to be gentle because we're going to be spiritually setting a broken limb. So for us to be harsh with the erring brother or sister, to be unforgiving, to have this critical spirit, is straight away we're on the wrong, uh, the wrong uh, attitude here. And it says with gentleness. It can be translated meekness. That is a strength in gentleness. It is coming alongside someone, avoiding all unnecessary harshness, yet without compromising. I heard about a, a pastor being greatly used and someone who knows him very well said it's amazing. The only time we don't display any, uh, anything negative, but, but the only time he will be very firm is on truth itself. But everything else, they've been abused, they've been shouted at, they've been slandered, they just take it, meekly take it, and then carry on with the word of God. The man I admire the most at the seminary, when we were discussing... Uh, uh, trying to understand theology, you discover, you think your position, which you've held for so long, is actually wrong. And you go, whoa, 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 what about this, that, or the other? Just the, the spiritual ones, very gently. Well, if you considered this, it's interesting the word of God says that. The wrath of man does not provoke the righteousness of God. So it's this gentle spirit, but it's not a weak spirit, like when there's negativity coming your way, which it will do if they're in pain, you're trying to set the limb, that you back down, it's just gently but lovingly holding to your position. We think of the spirit of, of Christ. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. What beautiful words they are. If you're feeling just a smoking Christian this evening, your light has gone down to a faint ember. Or you're just a bruised reed, you're not strong enough, you don't feel strong enough to use, just to be discarded. But the Lord says, I'll never do that. I'll never do that. I will come alongside you. I will restore you. You return to me. We read these words recently in the context of the backsliding believer. They're beautiful words, aren't they? What do you think? The words of Christ. If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one is, is straying? And if he should find it, Assuredly, I say to you, he rejoices more over that sheep than over the 99 that did not go astray. What a lovely attitude. There's someone, they've fallen into sin. And the heart of the believer, the heart of the pastor, the elder, the deacon is, how can we restore this poor brother? They've fallen into sin. What can we do? Sadly, in churches, people get in that much of a bad spirit. They rejoice in the iniquity and they're almost disappointed when the person's restored. They say, well, it can't be this easy for them to come back. And they've come back tear-stricken, tear confessing their sin. So what do we do? Well, we come along in a spirit of love with the word of God. We try and show them from the word of God, not just hurling texts at them where they've gone wrong. We're patient. We're not going to lord it over them. We're not going to rejoice in their fall. We're going to want them to be healthy again. And as they begin to see their sin, we're going to assure them of the forgiving love of Christ to all that truly repent and go to him, confess in their backslidden situation. Remember, the joint is going to be out of place spiritually. They're going to be in pain. And as the treatment is applied, they are going to push back. They may well just, with a short conversation, hold their hands up. But there is going to be some pain. And we're going to have to be patient and not bite back. They are going to get angry or, or other emotions. It's this gentleness without compromise. 2 Timothy 2 verses 24, 25. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, and patient. And if we're a body, we will feel their pain, won't we? So then the restoration will feel sweet. We'll say, they're back. They're worshipping with us. They've forsaken that attitude or that sin. This is lovely. The body is now, now complete. 
That's why it's so lovely when we can all gather together, isn't it? At church meetings, at the prayer meetings, the body of Christ, the family here at Mount Zion, which the Lord has called. We're all together before our Heavenly Father. We're all with our struggles, but we've come together. Now, Matthew uh, 18, verses 15 to 17. We're given some instruction there. Bear with me while I find that. So this would be the discipline process, but this is a restoration process where Christ said, Assuredly, I say to you, oh no, I've got the wrong one. Sorry, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Now that's critical, friends. This is where we go wrong. We tell other people what someone has done against us. Go and tell them yourself and say, look, I'm upset. If you say, well, I, I can't do that, well, leave it then. Forgive them in your heart and move on. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And you might repeat this, the first step, several times. You might go back with someone else several times. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen, and a tax collector. So you've gone backwards and forwards, you've gone with someone else, and then clearly this must be a serious sin. This isn't because someone had a barbecue and forgot to invite you. You're not going to end up before a church meeting with that. So that shows us, doesn't it, that there's got to be a level of understanding amongst each other that we're all sinners. We're all going to rub each other up the wrong way. There should be an element of forgiveness. But if that person has fallen into sin, and despite all the loving intervention, and eventually the elders of the church get involved, and they still say, no, no, I've done nothing wrong, I'm going to carry on doing it, or whatever it is, then for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, lovingly you have to say to that person, you cannot sit at the Lord's Supper. You will no longer be regarded or treated as a member, as a fellow brother or sister in Christ. We hope that you will come to your senses. Now we have... I'm given some final instruction in this verse, and I shall be succinct. Vital. So, so far, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. And this is critical, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. What humility is needed. How easy it is to be like uh, the parable the Lord said where we have great big beams in our eye and we're looking at tiny specks in others. We must look attentively, contemplatively, one man says, at ourselves. What are we looking for? Well, remember, as we consider right at the very beginning of this verse, that all have sinned. We've all sinned. We're not sinless. I say this reverently, the Saviour had to bleed and die and suffer that awful judgment which we could not bear, which would take all eternity for us, because we're sinners. We're not in some great um, height of perfection. So we must remember that. Therefore, we've needed forgiveness too. We've known forgiveness. Secondly, uh, do we know the traits of this sin ourselves? We see it in someone else and go, actually, I remember that. Oh, I've... I've walked a little way down that pathway. Do we remember that? Do we consider that ourselves, whatever the sin is? Do we remember our own backslidings? Because we've all backslidden at some time, either outwardly or inwardly, and it's the same to the Lord. Can we remember that? Can we remember how we felt? And then having felt like that poor person does, with all those mixture of emotions, and yet deep down longing to be restored to communion with the Lord, full communion, they've not lost their salvation. Do you remember how miserable it felt? And how would we have liked someone to deal with us? Do we listen to someone comes running in and aggressive and firm? And What do you do? Now, I admit there are certain sins. You see someone about to do it, you would be very, uh, what's the word, firm and, you know, use an extreme example. I saw... One of you with a shotgun about to walk into the bank to rob it. He said, I'm desperate. It, would, it wouldn't be, now, dear brother, do you think you should be doing this? It would be um, a bit more urgent than that. But the spirit would still be the same. Why are you like this? What's, what's been going on that you've got to this point in your life? Do we recognise that we may not be currently struggling with that particular sin, or unknown to us anyway, 
But are we struggling with sin in another area? Do we say, well, look, they're struggling with gossip at the moment. Yeah, actually, I'm struggling with my temper a bit at the moment at home. Whatever it is, they're struggling with that. But I'm struggling with this. All these things. How would we be in their shoes and their, their pressures? You can't just look at the person and the trespass they've committed. Well, you can do, but you need to approach it holistically. So what is that person's situation? What pressures are they going through at the moment? What's going on in their life? Do I know anything of the background? Has this come as a bolt out of the blue? Or actually, if I was in their situation, would I actually be even worse? Would I have committed that sin in a greater degree? Do you see the point? You look at what they're going through. And lastly, have we fallen into a wrong spirit ourselves? Before we even think of trying to deal with this, are we in the right spirit? Or even as we consider it, are we more, as we look at uh, the situation of this erring believer, are we more with the works of the flesh? Or actually, are we with the fruit of the Spirit? Are we in the right spirit? Are we ready to deal with this? So there are many things to consider. Because if we don't, the Lord says, lest you also be tempted. That means to make proof of, to attempt, to test, etc. To try. You know, the Lord, one of the sins he hates is pride. Some of you smiled when I gave the example of the shoplifter calling out the car thief. But the Lord does not smile upon us when we do the same, when we're judgmental in our hearts, when he sees a hardening towards another brother or sister because they're in error. But he, he sees all the sin in our life and we're completely blind to it. And he says, you need to learn. I'm going to bring trials into your life and you're going to see what's in your heart because you've got so critical, you spend the time, we can all be like this, waving the finger, but yet you do not see the sin in your life. And woe betide a pastor that gets like that. It's the ruination of his ministry or anyone in any position of, of authority. So we have to uh, be aware our Heavenly Father in love will show us what's wrong. You see it amongst children, don't you? That's Any of you with children will have these explosive arguments because it will start off with, they said that, and then it went, yeah, but you said that, and it just explodes. They're just a, a, a pointing out of what's wrong in each other's lives. Well, believers can be like that. We must consider ourselves. You know, if you do come alongside someone, and I can testify to this, and uh, the Puritans testify to this, and many of you will know this. Uh, some of you have served as an elder. Even if you come along as best as you're able in your sinful flesh, to try and help some with all humility, with a genuine compassion and love. Often, whether it's weeks or months, the Lord would often put you in a similar situation to stop you in the future falling into pride, to say, well, I help that person, and by God's grace, I haven't fallen into that sin, but it's just words. And it's painful. The Lord shows you what's in your heart. Well, in closing, the last thing surely we must say is we cannot do this in our own strength. How closely we have to be walking to the Lord Jesus Christ. How we have to earnestly cry out for the help of the Holy Spirit and the direction of the Word of God. But this is where it's at, isn't it? This is the real Christian life. This is the Christ-honouring, the Christ-pleasing Christian life. And you can't manufacture it. You can't just think, I'll just put my Christian coat on and we'll do a bit of this. This is where it finds us all out from pastor to hearer if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit let us not become conceited provoking one another envying one another brethren if a man is overtaken in any trespass you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness considering yourself lest you also be tempted with the lord bless his word amen